Welcome back to Human to Human. I am your host, Jessica McDonald, and in today's episode, we have a guest coming on named Tess, and we talk a lot about queerness, shame, sex, the importance of sex education, how to feel empowered sexually. And before that, I'm going to give a trigger warning. We do talk about coercion. We talk about sexual contexts. We talk about shame. We talk about coming out. We talk about a lot of like the queer experience. Um, We don't touch enough on those who have been in the situation where they would need to come out as or they want to come out or they are coming out as queer and are not accepted. We touch on it a little tiny bit, but Tess really does a great job of explaining their own experience with gender identity and sexual orientation and what happened in their own life. Uh, But not everyone is as fortunate to have a safe space to be able to come out, express who they really are. And so I want to make this episode to create a space for that and to talk about the importance of gender identity, sexual orientation, pride, happy belated pride month. I mean, there's a reason this episode is not coming out in June on pride month. Uh, Stay tuned for the end for that. There's a great opportunity to get involved or just follow along with Sex and Self, which is a comprehensive sex education nonprofit that really focuses on teaching and creating a community where we have a better understanding of ourselves and our bodies and pleasure and sex and all of those things. So at the very end of the episode, Tess and I talk about how you can get involved if you're in college or university, how you can get involved if you're not in college or university or you don't want to commit to something. But overall, if you can't tell, I am very excited to be talking about this. I grew up uh, really surrounded by queer spaces, and I feel very, very lucky and fortunate to have grown up around uh, so much normalization surrounding gayness and lesbians and femininity and sexuality, and I went to art school, so that's why. Please enjoy this episode with Tess and follow Sex and Self on Instagram or check out their website to learn more about sex and our anatomy and reproductive health and how to have the best pleasure. They post about sex toys and let's fucking normalize all this stuff because it's a part of life and it is a very intimate private part of life. Um, But the more education, the better and the more comprehensive, accessible and you know, correct information, the better. There's so much we learn that's not factual because we grow up and we just hear rumors about different things like women don't masturbate, which we totally do. And it's something we should enjoy and celebrate. Uh, So enjoy. Tess, welcome to Human to Human. I'm so excited to have you here today. We are talking about sex, shame, personal experiences, and I would love for you to start by giving a little intro about yourself, how you identify, and you can touch on your coming out journey a little bit too. Sounds great. Thank you for having me. I am ecstatic. Um, I think of myself as a professional overshare, as I said, minutes before beginning recording. So I'm very excited to overshare. Um, So yeah, my name is Tess. Uh, My pronouns are they, she. I identify as gender fluid and as a lesbian. Um, I have a very complicated relationship with gender. Um, Basically my pronouns fluctuate, my gender fluctuates. Some days I wake up and I'm like, I am a woman. And then some days I wake up where I'm like, absolutely not. Um, Some days I'm very much in the middle. I have sort of androgyny, I have femininity. We kind of just flip flop. Sometimes it's both, sometimes it's neither, sometimes it's one or the other. And uh, I'm a lesbian, took me a while to realize that. I'm currently 21, I'm in my undergrad, I'm studying psychology and neuroscience at the University of Guelph. And I have only identified as a lesbian for a couple years. Um, I came out at, what is it, I'm 21. I came out, I think at 18 and uh, during the panini, the panoramic, (laughs) Polaroid, whatever you wanna call it. um, That was sort of where I, discovered my identity. Um, I started questioning my sexuality at age 16 and I did that thing where I like, I repressed it and decided to forget about it for a while. So when I was 16, I was in a relation, a hetero relationship. Um, I 
I just didn't let myself think about it. I thought, okay, maybe I'm bisexual. Um, after I ended that relationship, I was kind of just like, okay, now I guess I can think about this. Um, and I went from being like, okay, I have a strong preference for men, but I'm bi to going, okay, no, it's 50, 50. Okay. No preference for women. And then I reached a point where I thought to myself, okay, it's like 99% into women, 1% into men. And then I was like, okay, we're, we're getting pretty close to the lesbian thing. It's actually the lesbian thing. <laughs> Oh my God. I love it. How did you cope with and manage the process of one coming to terms with your sexuality in that way, but also, you know, how you said waking up, sometimes you feel very, very feminine one day, sometimes you're in the middle. How do you process that and also communicate that to the people around you? The, the gender thing is a lot harder to communicate than sexuality. I would say, um, especially with my, with my family, like I, I think it was pretty obvious to them that I was queer for most of my life because I was like every celebrity I was obsessed with was queer. So I was constantly talking about like Neil Patrick Harris or like hearing about someone who was queer. I became instantly obsessed with them because they were queer. And I think my parents were like, interesting. Okay. Um, nice. Love that for you. And I was like, I think a lot of queer people can relate to this being the really really emotionally invested straight ally like and I'm saying this with air quotes like it, it's just like oh I'm just like I'm just so passionate about queer rights like I go to pride and I cry when I think about queer rights but it's just because I love queer people you know or I would lie in bed at night and just think oh I wish I was queer because I get this sense of belonging with the community and that's a real one like where I'm like you know I don't think cishets wish they were not cishet I don't think they think about that um so that was a huge thing too and so, yeah, with my family, I think it was just like a, okay, we saw this coming. Like you talk about queer stuff a lot. You're obsessed with queer people. You wear rainbows. Makes sense. And then the gender thing, we don't have a lot of conversations about that one. Like I once got a question from my dad. He was like, oh, Facebook uses they, them pronouns for you. Like what's going on there? And I was just like, okay, dad, I guess it's time to tell you I don't have a gender. Um, yeah. And I people see it as almost like a, okay, you're already gay. Why are you doing this other thing that makes it hard for us to understand you? Mm. And, you know, I've reached a point where family, they, they're going to she, her, me, and I've accepted it. Um, and then pe other people around me, it's almost like my gender, because I have this gender fluidity thing, it's almost like my gender changes a little bit with people's perception of it. So if there are a lot, if it's a queer space, I just use they, them because queer people, they can rhyme off they, them like that. And it's like a normal thing for us. Whereas if I'm in a space where I know people are going to be like, oh, this is a hard thing for me to remember. If they're using they, them for me, and it sounds forced, it's actually worse than mm. just she. And people find that confusing because they're like, okay, it sounds to me like you're trying to accommodate people who don't understand you. And it's like, okay, no, but like my gender is literally so complex that people's perception of my gender influences my gender. And it's very hard to explain. But yeah, that's sort of like the whole navigating spaces as a queer person, as a gender fluid person is complicated. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like through that, there must be a lot of shame from different sources, systems, people that is put on you. And let's actually talk about shame, internal shame. Have you experienced putting on shame within like, yeah, but within yourself throughout this process? Oh yeah. We got, we got ounces of shame. We've got, we've got oodles and oodles of shame. We've got, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's tough because I've spent such a large part of my formative years feeling shame because mm -hmm. when you're a young child you don't understand these feelings you're having and I clearly remember one time where I was in this like small group of friends in sixth grade we all sat at the same table together there was four of us it was two girls and two guys and well, I call myself a girl but you know person um and we were really close we were really friendly with each other and we hung out a lot on this one field trip that my mom was on with us and I remember at the end of the day my mom was like oh you must have a crush on one of those boys right and I I just had this like gay panic moment where I just picked one and was like sure that one mm. <laughs> <laughs> So there was a lot of things where like my feelings towards guys were very forced makes sense I'm a lesbian um and my feelings towards girls I just didn't understand I would just be like oh she's just like really really pretty and I wish I looked like her or like she's really really nice and I wish we were best friends and those are crushes they're just not labeled that way in my small brain um 
and then so there's that there's going through puberty and you know I had a lot of issues with like my body image like I was like a late bloomer so I just like hated myself for not looking a certain way that continued um and then you get to sexuality I started dating really really young so I started dating guys at age 14 and it was basically this guy showed interest in me and I liked male validation because you're always told you need male validation to live so you know here I am in a relationship and that just makes the shame worse. So it's like snowballing because you start with a little bit of shame and then you do things that make it worse. And it just kept growing to the point where in the pandemic, everything hit a, like came to a head because I had to deal with it. Yeah. And I feel like as you get older and you start to understand how society affects you and how the hetero narrative is so pushed from the moment, like you're becoming becoming a little human when you're growing up and you're at the age of five, even there's the language of, Oh, is that a boy you're, you're, you're crushing on? Or do you have a boyfriend? And that's, it's very, you know, forced upon you that it's really challenging. And it makes sense that it takes until being a bit older, being in the, in your late teens, also the pandemic forcing you to face whatever shit's going on, but in your school system or in your family life, if there was more discussion about the queer community and sex education, what do you think would be different for you? Yeah, it was, it was definitely interesting because I can look at my exposure to different things. Like, as you said, like from infancy, you know, you're told you're going to have boyfriends, you're told you're going to get, you're going to marry a man. And these all become your life goals, especially someone who's raised female and like socialized as female. That's like your entire life. Like you watch all the Disney movies and she needs to get a man at the end. They need to get married. Like that's the storyline. And um, my first exposure to queerness in general was Glee. And I didn't watch Glee until I was (laughs) Um, love glee (laughs) oh gleek over here yeah um and so if I had just known and it was it was too late at that point like I had internalized all of the heteronormativity and it was too late because queer people were like this like separate different thing like now we can talk about but we don't really want to be that so it, it didn't become okay when I, at age 13, it became a thing I was suddenly aware of. Mm-hmm. And I really like, I get very passionate about just human rights in general. And my thing that really sets me off is when people are just like, oh, but like, if we watch queer television, it's going to make our kids gay. And that one like really gets me because I'm like, okay, cool. But like, I watched hetero TV my entire life and I could not be gayer. So like, like, that didn't make me straight. That didn't make me, yeah, it made me feel like I have to play into the heteronormative narrative, but I didn't want to. And yeah. 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 Like it made me hate myself, but it didn't make me straight. So, you know, and I would hear things from my family about like my, my mom once said to me when I was six years old, she was like, you know some girls marry girls. And she gave me no, I don't remember the context of it, but she didn't say anything else. And so my six-year-old brain was just like, what did she just say? Like, what does this mean? And we never talked about it again. Like I never heard that again. Or I'd hear small little comments. I remember an older relative once saying like, oh, the Teletubbies are politically incorrect because like one of them carries a purse. So he's clearly gay. And I didn't know what that meant. And five-year-old me was like, hmm. It's like these one-off comments that have no context and you gain no deeper understanding to them. And when you were talking about this too, it made me really think that there's just so much othering. Like, oh, if someone's queer and you're growing up and you're seeing that in Glee or, you know, in a celebrity, you're like, and the way the language is used around you, it's like, oh, that's, that's the, uh, they're just another, like, that's, you know, something people are, but something we aren't kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's where the shame comes from, right? Because you you eventually do realize, like, I have these feelings that are different from what I've been told I'm supposed to feel, and I don't fit into any of the boxes I'm supposed to, and therefore there's something wrong with me. That was definitely a thing. Like, I know a lot of people right now are obsessed with Heartstopper. Like, there is this song playing, and it just goes, like, why am I like this? Why am I like this? And, like, I can't 
that's like the perfect way to describe it. Like there's a scene where someone's questioning his sexuality. He looks up like, am I gay? He starts doing the quizzes. You see a single tear falling down his face and that song is playing. And it, it like even just talking about it, I'm getting emotional because it's just like, that's exactly what it is. It's like you're, you're inside, like it's like being trapped in like a palace in your own mind. And it's like, there's a million doors and you're opening all of them, but there's no one there to help you. And you're just like running around, like you're just lost. And mm-hmm. it's, it's so in your own head because like, like once you verbalize it, you're done. Like you can't take it back. Yeah. And especially when you're verbalizing it to someone who probably isn't going through the same thing or can't relate to you or hasn't, especially if it's your family too, they don't have that education that it can be a lot harder. I want to talk about what made you be like, okay, I'm going to come out and that, how, how that process unfolded. Yeah, it was um it was kind of interesting for me because my mom is a very open person like and I've become like this as well because I sort of model myself after her but she my entire life and growing up and she would just kind of say things like just like randomly out of the blue oversharing type of things which I love. I think that's amazing. Um and she she would always follow it up with like okay, the reason I'm doing this, like you might think I'm crazy, but the reason I'm doing this is so you will do it for me. Like when, as you're growing up, you will tell me whatever's on your mind, whether or not you think I want to hear it and we can process it together kind of thing. Um, So I was very aware that like my mom was cool. My mom was liberal. My mom was like, let's talk about crazy things. Right. And so I would sort of hint to her little like I'd give her little nuggets and she was picking them up mm-hmm. um so I remember being maybe 17 I've been dating guys for a couple of years at that point and I just said to her you know I think at some point I want to take a break and date girls and she I could tell she was surprised she was like oh interesting but she she literally was just like okay cool and mm-hmm. um during the beginning of the pandemic when things were like really bad like we weren't leaving our house I um sat down next to my mom and I just said I just said you know I don't want to talk to my boyfriend. I don't want to be with him. I don't want to look at him. Every time he calls me, I get irritated. I don't know why. Um, and she was like, okay, it's time to end that. Yeah. Um, and then I said to her, okay, well, also side note, this is unrelated. Um, I don't know who I like. It might be girls. It might be guys. It might be both. I'm figuring it out. And she was just like, all right, cool. Like, yeah. I think you be by yourself and process this a little bit. And it really wasn't because I think in TV, you think of it as like the, you sit down formally, you say, I have something to tell you, and then you you do it. I think that does happen. But for me, it was the dropping of hints leading up to it. Mm-hmm. I love that you said that it's, it is perpetuated, that it's this like big moment and you sit people down and you're like, I need to tell you something. And it's all this formal hugs and I still love yous and all of that. But I think it's a lot easier to wrap our heads around slowly giving those hints and easing someone into it, even though, you know, we shouldn't have to do that. But at the same time, I think it's less scary in a lot of ways. It is. Yeah. I want to hear more about kind of the signs from your, like, because you you mentioned something about, um, I forgot exactly what it was, but like, it, it just made me think of like your body telling you oh when you're when you're breaking up with your your boyfriend like your body being like oh I'm irritated when he calls me and I don't want to talk to him and I am such an advocate for like your body's going to give you signals for what's right and what's wrong and I'm sure there was a lot of sensations you experienced even watching Glee and slowly diving into the queer space more so I'd love if you touched on that in any way yes and this is something that I would hope could actually help people because I've every person I talk to, especially people who are younger than me, like I just go on this rant, like when they ask me about dating, because I've dated several many people at this point, and I've had several many experiences dating said people. And the thing I, I look back on with such regret when I was in high school was, so there's something called compet, which is experienced by queer people in general, but specifically lesbians for the most part. Um, And it's just this feeling that you need male validation. Um, it's like what, what cures you of your life, of the existence of being a woman or a femme person. Um, and what happens is you mistake the desire for male validation to being attracted to men, which is two very different things, but they sat, they feel similar. Mm -hmm. So 
I, a lot of my crushes I had on guys was actually just, they liked me. So it would be convenient to like them back, which is how I ended up dating guys a lot of the time. If they pursued me, I'd be like, cool, someone likes me. Like, I don't like myself. So maybe they'll make me like myself. Yeah. Um, not a good reason to date someone, but that's what happened. And um, so my first experiences with guys at every step of the way, it felt so wrong, but I was convincing myself that like the nerves and the discomfort were butterflies. Oh my God. Not true. Butterflies are supposed to be good. Didn't realize that till I was like 19 because I started having actually affirming experiences. But yeah, like he wanted to hold my hand and I was pulling away or he wanted to put his arm around me and I was pulling away or like it took me so long to kiss the guy because I didn't want to and he had to basically beg me to, which is weird and shouldn't do that. Um, And it was just like every single milestone, and there's a lot of them, every single one, I just like felt something in the pit of my stomach that was like, this is wrong. Like, this is bad. And uh, I didn't listen to it because like I said, I didn't like myself and I wanted validation from someone. And like, if you're around and you're offering it, then I'll take it because I was like 15 years old and sad, you know? Yeah. It's crazy. Anxiety and excitement actually physiologically look the same way in your body. So like sweaty palms and racing heart and, you know, tight stomach that I've thought about it a lot in terms of when I think I'm anxious, but I'm actually excited for something like before I do a podcast interview or a job interview, you know, I'm like feeling very anxious, but sometimes that can just mean I'm excited. But the reverse of that is very interesting. And I haven't even like thought about that. And I feel like that's exactly what you were describing. Yeah. And I'm a person with anxiety, so I could easily rationalize it, right? Like as a teenager, just being like, oh, I'm just anxious because I care about how this is going, which is yeah. like, but I'm, I experienced that now. Like I am in a fairly new relationship. And when we first started out, like every time I was going to see her, I was very, very anxious, but also very, very excited. And like, I knew why I was anxious and why I was excited. Whereas dating guys, it was like just, just anxious, but I thought it was excitement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm crazy our bodies know and it's just I think this is why sex education is so important because let's talk a little bit about your journey with that and if there was I'm assuming it wasn't great uh just we're gonna like prelude prelude that that if there was better communication and understanding of these feelings and thoughts and we're not educated well about queerness in general, but we also aren't educated that well about mental health and listening to our bodies and knowing what's right and what feels uncomfortable and what consent is. So the fact that it like sex ed, like typically in most, you know, Ontario school systems lacks both is just a recipe for disaster, a recipe for shame. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I have some serious horror stories because I also went to public school. So, you know, it's craziness and uh I remember specifically there was a scenario where we had to fill out this sheet and it described like penis and vagina penetrative sex and there were fill in the blanks that you had to put words in and this one guy in the class was being really rowdy and disruptive so to punish him the teacher made him read it out like how sex works and that was that was his punishment was reading out you know the description of sex like the penis is inserted into the vagina Mm -hmm. and you know of course he's so ashamed because we're in like seventh grade and when you're in seventh grade sex is hilarious and it's a thing we laugh about and make jokes about even though we don't understand it yeah and you know that's just the first example of them like perpetuating shame onto us about sex because we're supposed to be curious about it it's supposed to be this open environment where we can have discussions but instead it's like a okay, I know no one wants to do this, including me, the teacher. So let's just get through this and like make it embarrassing and awkward instead of open and helpful. Um, And then that same teacher in grade eight, we had, we were talking about coercion and instead of, you know, handling it with grace as you should because it's a difficult and complex and traumatizing topic the teacher was like hey let's make jokey skits about it and it was two guys so it was like haha they're gay like let's laugh about the fact they're gay and let's let's laugh about the coercion because haha that's funny and like ooh, ooh, like looking back that is so so terrible and inappropriate and Mm -hmm. like I'm genuinely angry about it because I was I've been in experience like I've experienced coercion and I didn't know how to deal with it because I was not taught how to deal with it when I should have been Mm -hmm. um 
we did learn a little bit about queer identities. I was lucky enough that I was in the 2015 curriculum before it got removed by fucking Doug Ford. Um, and we actually learned what each letter of the alf, like the LGBT, we call it the alphabet mafia on TikTok, but like we learned what each letter of the alphabet mafia actually stands for. And I was able to use it in real life. I remember being at work when I was like 18 and one of my stupid coworkers was like, hey, why are there so many letters? What do they all mean? And I like rambled all the letters and what they meant. And he was just like, where did you learn that? I'm like, yeah, that's right. I'm an emotionally invested straight ally. I know all the letters. <laughs> at the time (laughs) yeah um but you so you know we covered the letters but we didn't cover like how queer sex works and no one taught me that like I was fully just and that's part of how I came out was I I started scrolling on TikTok and TikTok started telling me I was gay before I knew I was gay like oh my god it's such a common story (laughs) one of my friends who's bisexual she's like I've been on TikTok for a day and they like it already knows I'm bisexual Yeah, it was so aggressive too. It was like fully like lesbians coming up to the camera being like, that's a gay. And they'd be like pointing at the camera being like, that's a gay. And I'd be like, who, me? A heterosexual with a boyfriend? Who, me? And you know, they were, they were right. They knew somehow. Like, (gasps) and then the lesbian thirst traps come in and I'm like, okay, cool. I'm definitely a lesbian. Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god it's it's insane the experiences that I think you've had and so many other people have had in the public school system that is just so shameful and there's no compassion for sexual trauma and how triggering these conversations can be especially when they're 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 taught so lightly and like it's just hilarious and that just perpetuates so much shame in, internally um when did things start to kind of shift for you do you have uh, a feeling of more empowerment towards your sexuality your gender identity and how we can go to sex and self maybe in a part of that yeah absolutely um it it was definitely a process um it's very interesting because as like when I identified as a cisgendered heterosexual person, I was the most sexually repressed anyone could possibly be. I remember it was hard for me to say the word kiss to my partners wow. and mean it. Like, I could never say like, I want to kiss you to a guy because I didn't. And I, yeah. I, like, it, I couldn't utter the word kiss. Like I couldn't do it. And so, you know, everything related to sex, when I was having sex with men, I couldn't, I couldn't talk about it. I didn't want to think about it. Like, I remember like, the concept of, int- I was thinking about this earlier today, the concept of intimacy was not a thing when I was identifying as hetero. I remember like having sex with men and they would always be like, oh my gosh, like, like just like lying with here with you afterwards, like the best feeling ever. And I remember thinking, no, 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 no. Like I need to get up. I need to get my clothes. I need to get out of here. Like, and that was how I would think. Like, I was just like, I don't know why you think this, like, this is terrible and I hate this. And that's not how you should do sex. It should not be like, this is terrible and I hate this and I want to get out now. Um, so it's really hard to be sexually empowered or even empowered in your body when you hate it this much. And it has all of this, it has the association of shame. It has like, like I wasn't comfortable being naked around my partners, which is like not a good part of sex. Like that's not what you want. And I thought it was because I hated my body, which I did, but it was also because I didn't like my partners. And like, so there's this like, it's all very, very, very intertwined. Like sexuality is very much connected to sex and your experience with sex. And I mean, gender is a thing too, for sure. Um, And self-worth, I feel like plays into that so much too. And if you're repressing so much, your self-worth is going to be really low. You're not going to want to be vulnerable with your partners, especially if you don't feel safe. And even more so if you don't feel safe, even with yourself and realizing how you're feeling uh, in your own life with, you know, your sexuality. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head there. Like, and it comes back to like my mental health struggles as well. Like I have depression and anxiety, and I also have some spicy little PTSD in there too. Um, And there is a, something called the lesbian master doc um people who are questioning if they're a lesbian definitely a good thing to check out i remember reading it and it just had the sentence like it was like a list of things if you do these you might be a lesbian and one of them was uses sex with men as a form of self harm and i read that and i was just like holy shit <laughs> like whoa like this is making sense yeah. um and okay so where was i on this so yeah feeling empowered and stuff um actually coming out it's, you know, there's going to be shame around that for a while. Um, like I remember saying to my, my dad, like a few months after I come out, I remember just saying like, I still feel like there's something wrong with me. I still feel like one day everyone's going to wake up and decide they don't accept me and take it back. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And it takes a while to sort of sit with this idea of I'm different than the world wants me to be. There's people who are going to hate me no matter what. And it's a lot to process. Like it does take a while to process. Um, reaching a point of empowerment though was, I, I don't know how exactly I flipped the switch in my brain, but there was one day where I said, you know, I've hated my body for a really long time. We're going to cut that out now. Like, we're just going to, we're just going to not and say we did. And so <laughs> I still have days that are hard. Like I'm a pretty flat chested person. And it was very hard for me to accept that about myself. Um, like my body's changed a lot, like taking antidepressants, my weight fluctuates a lot more than it used to, or even just like, you know, what they call the freshman 15, when you start university, that was a thing that changed my body as well. And I, I actually just reached a point where I was like, you know, the love and respect and admiration and appreciation that I have for women as a lesbian, I'm going to translate that onto myself because yeah. I love feminine bodies. I love soft tummies. I love thick thighs. I love stretch marks. They're, they're gorgeous. They're beautiful hip dips. They're sexy as hell. And all of those things, I literally was just like, you know, I have stretch marks. I have thick thighs. I have a soft tummy. I have all these things that I find attractive in women. Why did I decide to hate them about myself? Because there is just about nothing about women that I don't like. So I was just like, you know, we're going to do that for me. We're going to do that to me because if I wasn't me, maybe I would find me attractive. <laughs> and now, I just, now I do this really silly thing and people ask me like, how are you so confident? It is all fake. I'm telling you right now, it is all fake. Like every time my girlfriend compliments me, I just go, I know. Like, she'll be like, beautiful. And I'll be like, I know. <laughs> and, and she always laughs and I, I know it sounds cocky and ridiculous but you you gotta do it like you gotta try it because you'll reach a point where you believe it like you'll pretend so long that you'll just like believe it and yeah. it'll work for you I love that I lo it's like the fake it till you make it method and that it's not black and white it ebbs and flows some days are harder than others but I think sometimes it is a a, a flip switch where you're like you know what what if I looked in the mirror and I was like, I look so hot today instead of the, like, it's just changing the narrative that you've, you've been in for so long and deciding to, to make that choice. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say like sexuality and sex in general suddenly became a positive thing when I realized I was queer because I realized I could actually enjoy sex. Mm -hmm. And that was a very foreign concept to me, which, you know, I think I was I think I was 18 turning 19 when I was like dealing with sexuality and coming out and all of that. It was like the summer after the pandemic started. And that was sort of around when I joined Sex and Self as well. Like I've known Felicia, the founder for a couple of years. So I knew her like before this whole journey when I was still really repressed. And I remember like her posting about it. And I remember looking at it and just thinking like, this is amazing. I wish I was confident enough to partake in something like this. And then, you know, a couple of months after coming out, they were recruiting and I thought, you know, I actually am ready to partake in this. Like, I actually do want to talk about sex and I actually am interested in sex because like it suddenly went from being like a thing that I hated that I was repressed about to a thing that I could like be curious and interested in. And it was, it was like starting over. Like I actually yeah. talk about being with my current girlfriend as like being like the, the teenager having their first relationship. Like that's what it feels like. Um, because it's like finally actually right and meeting all the milestones correctly or I shouldn't say correctly in an affirming way like in a comfortable way in like an exciting way in like a having actual butterflies way um so yeah like joining sex and self was like a huge part of my journey and my empowerment um I remember like in the fall semester this past year, like I was doing some promotional stuff and they actually sent me a free vibrator. So now I'm like starting this collection of vibrators and I tell all my friends all the time, I'm like, I've got, I've got a little box and they're like right over there at the end of my bed. Like I don't even try to hide them. I mean, when my mom comes, I do cause she's yeah. not ready to have the conversation. But like when, when my friends are over, I'm just like, yeah, those are my vibrators in the corner. Like you know, and I tell people all the time, I'm like, I know, I know where to get the good vibrators. Please ask me before you buy them. They're expensive. Make sure you get the good kind. Like it's, it's very, very fun. And I never would have seen myself as the person who talks about vibrators when people don't care to hear about it, but you know, it, it's just, there's something that feels so good about it and like, so right about it and being in sex and self with this like lovely group of women and vulva owning individuals who are comfortable talking about things that we're told not to like masturbation and self-pleasure and like just general empowerment in sex it's something that 
is so stigmatized for especially for women and for feminine people like it's like you know you're taught from the earliest of ages that your pleasure doesn't matter or like my favorite one is like the fallacy that the clitoris is hard to find like come on now people like it's really not hard at all like I know I'm saying this as a person with a clitoris but like you could put me anywhere in the vagina and I'll orient myself towards the clitoris because it's not <laughs> I love it. Well, and when I was in middle school, I distinctly remember guys being like, do you masturbate? And girls being like, oh my God, no. Oh my God. Ew. And then the guys were like, oh, like we do. And it was like, so ingrained from such a young age that like, you're supposed to lie about masturbation. You're not supposed to do it. And there's just so much stigma around pleasure. And when we're not just having sex to reproduce, like we're having sex to feel good and to feel connected to someone else and feel connected to ourself. And we need to talk about it. And this is why I love sex and self so much in this community and who it's connected me to, because when you talk about it, we can normalize things. We can hopefully validate people, especially people listening to this and who've been on a queer journey that it's okay. And we can feel good about it. And we can feel empowered to love our body and love our pleasure and love our partners. I would love for you to give a little overview of what is sex and self what the community you, you already kind of dove into the community, but like, why would people want to join the community? What, what could it do for individuals? Yeah. So sex and self, it's a registered Canadian non-for-profit. It was started uh, in Montreal at McGill university. Um, it's basically, we're currently expanding to be Canada wide. And um, the entire idea is just to educate and empower Volvo owning individuals, um, providing sex education, sexual wellness seminars, um, just having calm, open and honest conversations about sex. Um, the whole idea is just like breaking down sexual stigma, making individuals feel happy and comfortable and empowered in their bodies and their sexualities, in their gender, um, lots of fun things. Um, I would say just like anyone who's curious about sex, who wants to talk about sex, like a lot of us will compare our mostly terrible sex education. Some of us might be lucky and have better ones, um, but there's a lot of conversations about just education. Um, and we talked a lot about pleasure. That's a huge topic in sex and self as well. Um, and I would just say it's a really comfortable, really open place for people to have conversations that are normally stigmatized. It's a place where we can use the words, you know, like the, the buzzwords, penis and vagina, that like everyone is so afraid to teach children, even though they're literally just body parts. Like we can actually use those words. And like, we love to use the word vulva because, you know, people like to point and be like, that's a vagina. It's like, no, 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 the vagina is the whole, the vulva is the whole thing. Um, and I didn't even know that until I was in sex and self. And that just proves how bad we are at teaching people their own anatomy. Yeah. Um, I can have conversations about that too, of like, I didn't know where tampons went until I was 18 because no one, no one taught me to try to understand my own body because especially like with vulvas and vaginas, we just like refuse to try to understand them. We act like they're this like complicated labyrinth of a thing, which they're really, really not. I don't know how we decided that as a society. I know. Uh, <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's like sort of an overview on sex and self. We're going to be recruiting university representatives, which is highly exciting. I'm actually the university representative coordinator. So I'm the person that people will talk to about that. I'm going to be doing a lot of the interviews and a lot of the process. I send out fun little emails. Jess can tell you about that. <laughs> I send lots of fun little emails. Um, and so basically we're looking for just anyone who's an undergrad or a, yeah, undergraduate degree at a university or at a college, um, mostly in Ontario, but I think everywhere in Canada or even in the U S if anyone in the U S is listening, we like you too. Um, <laughs> and it's a pretty small commitment. It's like five to 10 hours a month. I would say we have little meetings. It's just to sort of promote us around different universities. We're going to be having some really cool events open to the public where we can talk about sex in a really accessible way. That's our little teaser. You won't find out yet, but eventually where it's, it's in the works, it's being planned. So even if you don't want to join us directly, there are still ways that the public can get involved as well. Yes, I love it. I am the Toronto Metropolitan University 
formerly known as Ryerson University or a uni representative. Wow, that was a mouthful. Um, <laughs> and I love being able to be a part of the community and have these conversations and just feel like we're making change that is not only healing for us, but empowering for other people. And so just to reiterate, there are kind of two options to get involved with Sex and Self. When this episode is live, you can apply to be a university representative. So if you're at a college or university, uh, it's Again, like Tess said, it's quite a small commitment. We have one meeting a month right now, which is great and kind of get to get involved with the community, do some promotion stuff. And then the second option that is coming in the fall is open to the public and a way to learn with the community. And there'll be more details on that soon. And if you are someone who just also could use more connection in the queer space and want to learn more about your body, this is the place. It's so welcoming, so inclusive, and so educational in fun ways. (laughs) Absolutely. And I'd even just recommend looking at our website. Like you can even look at like the people we're partnered with. Um, There's lots of different tabs you can check out. And that's how I started shopping for sex toys and safe things because I knew they were associated with sex and self and that's how you know they're good. So just sexandself.com, great place to go. Um, And yes, I'm just in general, very excited. Yes, me too. And if someone listening also is intrigued, but not ready for any commitment, I think it's super fun also to just follow the Instagrams, listen to the podcast. I'll get you to shout out those handles. If you know them off the top of your head, they will be in the show notes though, if not. And that's a really fun way to just stay up to date on what's happening with the nonprofit and what's going on with the organization. And eventually if you feel called to get involved, you can. And I think it helps guide like you know ease people into being like oh maybe I will maybe I will listen to this podcast episode maybe I will join this thing they're hosting yes and I definitely as a uni rep in the fall of 2021 I definitely got a lot of people saying like this is really cool I'm not quite there but this is really cool and I'm watching from a distance kind of thing like one of our our promotions I was actually giving out like tote bags and t-shirts that said I masturbate on them from womanizer and that's amazing but not everyone was ready for it like a lot of people and I had a lot of people actually say to me directly like I do masturbate like I just don't want to project it to the world I was just like yeah I understand that that makes sense like Mm -hmm. They would just be like, I accept it as a part of life and I appreciate masturbation, but I don't really want people to see that. And I was just like, cool, nice. Like, thanks for sharing with me. And it was just great to like sort of open the door and make people think a little bit about like, what do these words mean and how can we accept them better? Um, Anyway, that was a side tangent, but the socials, we can go to just sex and self underscore is the nonprofit uh, account. And then there's also sex and self underscore podcast. So you can see the sex and self podcast. And there's also bodies A to Z underscore, which is that's a branch of sex and self that sort of like comes into different schools. I believe just in Montreal, they come to different schools and try to help with the sex education, which is just really, really cool. So those are the socials and uh, the website you can also find pretty easily. I think if you just search sex and self, it should come up. Perfect. Do you want to shout out any personal handles or websites for listeners to check out? Yeah, if people are interested, I call myself a professional overshare at the beginning. Um, I'm not really like a media influencer, but like I do like to share things on my personal Instagram. So if people are ever interested in my little ramblings about mostly about mental health and being queer, um, it's Tess IV01 and my TikTok is Tess the Baby Gay. Oh, I love that. (laughs) Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your own personal journey. It was so eye-opening. I think people will be able to take away from it and I learn from it too. And I hope this also kind of inspires listeners to follow Sex and Self, follow you, maybe get involved and be a part of the community even more. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was very fun. Of course. Thank you so much for tuning in. I have another exciting guest episode coming next week. It feels like an episode with just big sister advice. But if you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to share it with a friend. Hopefully some more people can take something away from this. Follow Sex and Self. Do some more sex education research. Know your body. Know what you want and own it. Live it. Follow uh, the podcast Instagram at human to human pod and my personal at Jessica J. McDonald. And I will be back with more episodes soon. And it is coming up to our two year podcast anniversary, which is crazy. Mm-hmm.